what I'm going to uh, show you together are the first results that we are obtaining in the framework of a European project in which we want to use ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete in extremely aggressive environments. As, uh, as John Belkovitz was saying before, today's problems, these are some uh, results, some ideas from a recent survey done by the European Commission going to invest two, more than 200 billion euros per year in the next decade in transportation infrastructures. But other, other uh, topics uh, are quite interesting and quite challenging. For example, we have in Europe a big issue in coastal protection because we have 66 thousand kilometers of coast, and that is three times the coastline of the United States. So you can imagine how big is the investment that has to be done to protect from extreme events that are becoming more and more frequently. And other two fields of development, the so-called green growth, for example, we are going to invest much more money in uh, no fuel, no fossil energies, but this needs research in how the infrastructure can develop. And also blue growth, how can we improve the uh, economic revenues from, from the sea. Well, as a matter of fact, these are uh, uh, new problems. And if we look at the codes, sometimes we see that the way we are able to solve now, it's with old technologies. If I look into the prescription in the codes for what in the European standards are the uh, exposure conditions for chloride and acids, I find some prescriptions which refer to the maximum water cement ratio to the minimum cement content and something about compressive strength, the cover and the crack width. Well, recently some uh, standards, some codes have been issued in Canada as well, in France, in Australia about the use of ultra high performance concrete. As a matter of fact, if you look at how the structures perform, these are examples. These structures were built 20 years ago with the code prescriptions. This is in Morocco, this is in, uh, in, in Valencia. Actually, this is like a caisson structure, so you could not see what's going to happen. And after 20 years, they're going to inspect and was quite, quite severe. But everything respected the prescription of the code. So what happened probably was the uh, issues on the construction field. How do you mix? How do you pour? How do you cure? That ended up in this. And uh, uh, this is a, a visit, an inspection that we made in a geothermal power plant. There is a region in Italy, in Tuscany, where there are a lot of geothermal power plants and issues that they drill and then the water that they use it for drilling comes out and has to be cooled down. That water contains a lot of sulfates, contains a lot of chlorides. And the cooling tower structure were made in concrete and you can see here how severely degraded it was. So they ended up in the last 10 years to abandon concrete and to use uh, gluid laminated timber with uh, inox steel joints, which was extremely, extremely expensive. The other thing is that you cannot see here, but the water there, it comes down like a rain and the tower has just one day per year of shut off for inspection and maintenance. So it's a continuous rain of this extremely aggressive water. So it's very, very, very challenging. And this is an example of how did they repair. And after some years, actually, they had always the same problem because this is the expensive products coming out. And this is an important problem because the European Commission did a survey and actually it was discovered that 50% of the repaired concrete structures failed once again and one out of four of them in the first five years after the repair. So there is not only the problem of building durable concrete structures, but repairing them in a durable manner in order not to be forced to continuously uh, investing money in uh, repairing of the structures. So there was a, a call for proposals issued by European Commission. We set up a consortium of 14 partners all over Europe, Spain, Italy, Ireland, Germany, Estonia, Greece, Malta, and Israel. We call it resilience because we want to make resilient structures. But one of the ideas that we could implement into UHPC some self-healing functionalities to further extend their lifetime. So these are the logos of the, of the partners of the project and my university, Politecnico, is the coordinator. And as a matter of fact, we are going to uh, implement our materials into six pilots. There are some basins in geothermal power plants, which are the ones I'm focusing on. Then we will have two offshore structures in, uh, in Spain, in Valencia. One is quite nice and quite interesting because it is a raft for mussel farming. Instead of being made of food, they made it with UHPC and they are much more resilient in the case of extreme events in the sea. 
and we have floating pontoons in Ireland, and this is a retrofitting of a water tower. It's part of some defense installation built by the British along the coastline of Malta before the Second World War. This is the side facing the sea, and it's severely damaged. The other side is in perfect state, and the cores drilling out. After 80 years, they gave out 40 megapascal strength. So being a concrete which was made 80 years ago and stayed 80 years in operation, it's extremely interesting. Well, uh, actually what we are proposing are a fit for the purpose solution. So the mixed design concept is UHPC, but we are going to differentiate each of them for each uh, uh, pilot. So actually I'm going to focus on this one, which is the one that we have developed in Milano for our uh, material. This, if it works, okay, that is the uh, first trial that we did in the in, in the lab, and my students made the movie and put Bruce Springs in the soundtrack. I hope he will not charge for the royalties. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, well, we were speaking about multiple cracking. You can see this is about 200 millimeter spacing on our specimen. We got a lot of cracks and we got about 30 NPA flexural strength. And obviously we wanted to use it in design. So we uh, employed a very simple true equilibrium equation procedure to back calculate the uh, tensile stress strain low before the localized cracking and then obviously we have a softening low and these are the results uh, well actually you cannot see the numbers but the tensile strength is about 8 to 10 megapascal and we have a strain capacity of around 1% which is quite good for the applications that we uh, had in mind at the beginning actually we are going to compare these results from the back identification with the results that we are obtaining with this uh, double edge wedge splitting test that we have developed in Milano. And we actually are demonstrating that applying a compressive stress because of the geometry of the specimen, you directly get tensile stress strain low. So you do not need for the back analysis. But which was the, the further idea that we are going to develop? As a matter of fact, we are dealing with extremely aggressive environment. So we wanted to see if we can improve the behavior of this material by adding some nano uh, materials, nano functionalities and the self-filling properties. So the key idea is not exactly the compressive strength. The tensile strength is okay for what we get, but the idea is, well, now people use regular concrete. They can go for a uh, high strength, high performance concrete, about 80, 90 megapascal. But our idea is that with self-filling, we can demonstrate that it's even better because we go back to the functionalities. The idea was to use nanotechnologies. This is the same graph that Constantine showed. And actually, I'm happy that we switched at the presentation because I'm using the same alumina nanofibers that he's using. So he dealt with the dispersion issue and things like that. So we mutuated the technology. So these are the alumina nanofibers, which are actually supplied by the same company in Estonia. And we also use the nanocellulose, fibrils and crystals. Well, one of the issues is that especially with the nanocellulose, the company provided them at 1% content of solid in the dispersion. But in UHPC, we have about 200 liters of water per cubic meter, and we wanted to dose the nanocellulose, even if you use 0.1, 0.2% by cement weight, all the water that is in the nanocellulose dispersion is probably higher than what you need to mix. So there was an issue in the beginning to be solved. They had to provide the nano uh, uh, pulp dispersion at a much higher concentration. So we ended up with something which was 10% of solid and we had to make a two-stage mixing because in the beginning we had to further disperse it with the sonication and then add into the mix. The interesting thing is that we obviously tested the material in standard 9% uh, relative humidity curing, and we observed that there was no significant difference between the reference mix and the one with the nano additions. But the other thing was that we cannot tell the company that they have to wait for 28, 56 days before just putting the water into their uh, basin because they want it immediately operating. So we tried to cure our material. We went to the tower. We brought big vessels of uh, this sulfuric water. It's more or less the same one that we use in a spa because it's not very aggressive. But, but the, the thing is that it contains sulfates a lot. So we cured the specimen under that same water. And we got this. This is the reference material. And with the nano additions, we get a better strength. So we are going to perform the microstructure investigation. It's probably that these nanofibers, they do not only uh, close the macro defects, interact with the nano defects, but probably they also leave less space 
to, uh, for example, the expensive degradation products to grow. And in this sense, we get an improvement of the performance. And this is something, for example, cured in the geothermal water. This is the reference uh, stress strain response of the material. And you see how does it improve if we put the nano additions, the best results we got with the nanocellulose. And further improvements may come from the fact this is the autogenous shrinkage test. This is the reference material. And you see that by adding the nano additions, we get a reduction of the uh, nano, uh, the autogenous shrinkage, which also means that when we are going to make it into structure where the geometrical constraint will prevent the free movements, we will also have reduced cracking potential, which also benefits. And finally, to come to the cell filling, these are the first results that we obtained. This is a crack. It is about uh, 100 microns wide. In one month cured in water, it is completely closed. One month wet and dry, well, it's partially closed, but it's natural. But what we are going to show now, this is the reference curve monotonically tested, whereas we pre-cracked the specimen, we unloaded, we cured for one month in water, and after that, we tried to reopen the crack. And on the second load cycle, we went even a little higher with the, um, with the stress. So this is probably because these products which grow into the crack, they try to open to expand a little bit into the crack. So there is some chemical pre-stressing, we call it that, and we want to demonstrate this. Well, as a matter of fact, when it comes to the cost, the company asked that how much is going to cost this material per cubic meter? And they jumped on the chair when we told them the price because it's four or five times as much. But what I told them is that we do not make cubes of one meter side with our materials. This is a nice installation by a Brazilian artist, which I saw in an exhibit in Milano. It's a one meter side cube of cement, and it's called Somos, we are. So yeah, I found it quite, quite inspiring for, for our work. But as a matter of fact, we have to think into a life cycle performance and into a life cycle cost, where even the self-filling functionalities can delay the first repair and can also result into a use of lower quantities of material. So just to come to the conclusion, the preliminary results of some structural design we are going to make, no linear analysis. The current solution for this basis is 40 centimeters thick wall because of the cover constraint. Actually, you, this is just one meter and a half tall. You have water on one side and you have soil on the other side. Statically speaking, the structure is not working too much. Well, obviously the worst condition in, in, is when uh, there is only the pressure on one side, whether it is soil or water. And these are the results that you get um, for the regular, for the regular concrete. We propose uh, the solution just simply using the better performance of the material. You can go down to a six centimeter thick wall. So the saving on the material is about six to one, and you just compensate all the costs. But then, and you see, these are the stresses that we got, and compared to the constitutive curve, we are here. So we are on the hardening stage, and we are at about 0.5% of strain, which could be a little bit too much in the serviceability limit state, but it's still in the range the material can sustain. So we try to even improve the structural concept. We say, why don't we think of something partially precast, just precast some square slabs and use some buttresses uh, cast in place and we install the slab and put the buttresses so that each slab will work like a square slab uh, clamped on three sides and free on the other one instead of being a big cantilever slabs. So in this case, the stress has reduced it, and you can see here we are at about seven MPA of uh, principal tensile stress on one side. But the most important thing is that the strain in the service condition is just 0.2%. And we were quite happy because 0.2% is more or less the yielding strain of conventional steel and it is the strain level for which we design in serviceability the regular concrete structure. So we tried also to establish an, an uh, analogy between the current design methodologies. That all, this is the research team we are working with. Most of the work has been done by co-workers and my, by master students and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Yeah. The, when the curve went down, was that because of actually a cracking or? Yeah, we cracked it, we unloaded. Unload we unloaded, yeah. When you reload it, it sort of had different symptoms coming back. Yeah, 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 there is different. Is that 
Yes, 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 yeah. Uh, actually, well, we just plotted there starting from the same point where we unloaded. Since the crack partially closed, we should have shifted a little bit back in order to be, to be consistent. We are trying to do this analysis now just to really quantify which are the benefits of, uh, of self-healing in terms of, rec we observe some recovery of stiffness as well. We observe some recovery in the stress. Obviously, you get a lot of benefits on the permeability and the durability because the crack is closed. It's narrower than before, yeah. Sure what I missed is what was the concept behind the self-healing? Well, the self-healing, what we are using, you, the, the technologies are multiple. What we are using are some mineral additions that are called crystalline admixtures. They are actually mixer of uh, reactive silica and other constituents. You disperse them in the mix, but when the crack opens, these particles, they, the, the water comes into the crack and you have some pressure of the water into the narrow space. So they react with the water and they react with the uh, cement, the unhydrated cement, because you have a lot of unhydrated cement in UHPC. And they produce some kind of modified calcium silicate hydrates that fills the crack. Yeah. All right. Yes, one more question. That, that, is one, that is one of the functionalities that we believe the nanocellulose provide. They act like internal reservoirs dispersed through the matrix. And then is one of the reasons for which they are the best performing with reference to the reduction of autogenous shrinking. It, it, it's like some internal curing that you are implementing in your material. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Thank Thanks you. a lot.